Yes, I, I have an aeroplane to catch, so I, I will be timely on this. So thanks very much indeed. Thanks for inviting me here. Thanks for inviting me to give this plenary. So I'm going to be talking about challenges, advances, and opportunities on marine protected areas globally. Um, so later on, you'll see some of the more unusual stuff we've been doing with partners such as Google to try and bring oceans to the attention of in excess to a billion people. Um, but really where I want to start is firstly a uh, thanks to Fran for the dive. This is a, just a, uh, a clip from some uh, HD film I took yesterday over the north coast. So I thought you might like to see a bit of marine life. Um, so let me uh, start by, by actually taking you back in history. So let me take you back to, to 1260s to the 1290s, the, the great grandson of Genghis Khan, uh, Kublai Khan. Um, and the fact that protecting the environment and managing the environment isn't a new idea. We've been doing it for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they used to, when uh, Kublai Khan was in power, have these, these amazing, uh, very elaborate hunts uh, across the landscape. But they also um, uh, valued the wildlife, protected it, actually made areas where they made sure there was a profusion of wildlife. And that's actually, in English, where the word paradise comes from. It's about the environment, a profusion of wildlife in it. So it's been a long time in the making, our recognition of the need to protect the environment. Um, in Britain, it was actually people like Henry VIII, who realized the need to conserve the natural resources. He was running out of wood to build his galleons, so he established the great parks. And then in 1872, Yellowstone in America, perhaps the best idea America ever had was to set up its national parks. And that was considerable length of time ago. Marine environment, it's been a bit more recent than that. The first marine protected area, we think, was around 1879, uh, an inlet near Sydney. And then you have to wait till 1935 for the, uh, if you like, the proper marine protected area ideas to emerge around the planet. So we've kind of been a long time coming forward on protecting the environment. And this, this presentation is actually partly my story. It's about our relationship with the ocean. We're all here because we're passionate in some form or another about the ocean, and it's touched our lives. For me, growing up in Jersey in the Channel Islands, I'm not, you're not going to get a closer photo of me at six years old, but I'm the little guy on the right-hand side of my brother and my parents, and I had a very close connection with the ocean. And I've seen the ocean change. And so this presentation is really about how we value the ocean, how it's changed, how we try and connect people to protecting the ocean. And during my lifetime, our perspective on the ocean changed fundamentally. A key moment in that was Christmas 1968 with the first photo taken from Apollo 8 in color of our planet from the surface of another body in the solar system, this time the moon. This was actually never planned by NASA. As they came around the far side of the, uh, the moon, Frank Borman and William Anders saw saw the Earth appearing from behind the far side of the uh, Earth. They grabbed a black and white camera. Um, William Anders asked Frank Borman to pass a color Hasselblad camera, and they took this photo. And they even joked that they might get into trouble because it was never in NASA's schedule to do it. It's argu arguably the most powerful environmental photo that was ever taken to show us of the finite nature of our planet. And so as I grew up, we continued to experience that, that perception of where we are in the universe. This was 1997, seldom seen photo from Voyager 1, the first time we ever took a photo of the Earth and Moon in the same frame. We'd have to wait until 1990 when Voyager 1 was leaving our solar system, and they asked it to turn around and take one last photo looking back into the solar system. And from four billion miles, they picked up Earth. It was a fluke of the light in the camera lens picking up Earth. And it's called the pale blue dot because what matters from four billion miles is not Earth, but ocean. And so we, we then realized the essential nature of the ocean on our planet. This is the most technically perfect photo taken of the Earth by the MODIS satellite. 
And what we've come to realize after spending billions and billions more is there's only a particular circumstance that leads to a planet that has ocean. And it sets us apart from places that probably used to have oceans like Mars, which are largely un uninhabitable unless you're in a feature film recently and you have a go at it. But basically the issue is that we, we have a planet, we have an ocean, and we should be uh, valuing it much more than we do. It's what sets us apart from other places. And it's a profusion of wildlife from some of the stars, as in starfish, through to things that perhaps are less familiar to people, look odd and bizarre, and many species yet to, to we have to discover. But where, whoever you are, wherever you are, the ocean makes a connection to us. When the ocean, and I hope this bit works, sings to us, it makes a connection. Humpback whales. So the ocean matters, and we've learned in recent years how much it does matter. We've valued the forests for so many decades, and it's only recently we've worked out the ocean is important for managing carbon, the missing carbon sinks, which are particularly important around the coast, carbon in open ocean ecosystems like krill that still isn't factored into any of the management. And what we know when you factor the ocean is, is it stands in, it stands up pretty well against things we've valued on land, and if you actually try and calculate it, as it was calculated just a year or so ago, you, you find that the ocean, if it was an economy, would be the seventh, seventh largest economy in the world. The amount it's worth dwarfs the largest sovereign wealth funds of the world. So it's slightly odd that we don't pay more attention to making sure it's in a healthy condition. We know the causes of ocean decline. It's the rising demand for resources, technical, technological advances, the decline of fish stocks, climate change, and weak high seas governments, governance, which I'll come back to in a minute. We also know from studies like WWF's study last year, looking at the actual data, that we have a serious issue of ocean decline. They looked at the trends of nearly 6,000 populations of just over 1,200 species. And we found <clears throat> through that that between 1970 and now, we have something like a 49% on average decline. In some species groups, some of the fishery groups, it's much more, it's up to 70% decline. So what do you see when you look back at our planet? Do you see the pretty blue planet? Do you see a planet that actually provides an ocean that provides a considerable proportion of the oxygen we breathe. This pale uh, greeny color is modeled by NASA. It's Prochlorococcus. It was something that was only discovered back in 1986. So it's only very fairly recently we realized it wasn't some variety of plant or species of tree that there was, was the most photosynthetically abundant organism on the planet. It's a cyanobacteria in the marine environment that provides a considerable amount of the oxygen you breathe. So every time you breathe, you don't owe it just to the forest, you owe it to the ocean. Or do you see an ocean that is largely still unprotected? So I promised to show you this from yesterday. So the blue area is the high seas, and this is the half of the planet that we're not allowed to have a conservation framework for yet. You can't designate a protected area in that blue bit like you can on land. It, it's ridiculous. In 2016, we have that injustice. Uh, I'd like to debate where we put marine protected areas out there and have discussions, not have an inability not to be able to have marine protected areas. Do you see an ocean that is full of habitats yet to be discovered? Many of the novel new habitats, habitats not powered by the, the power of the sun have been discovered within the last 30 years or so. These are the sea mounts, the mountains in the ocean. Or do you see an ocean that is increasingly compromised? This is some work that Ben Halpin and colleagues published in Nature in uh, 2015. It looks at various um, impact classes, I think around 29 of them. And the conclusion from this is around 41% of the ocean is heavily impacted. 
unimaginable in 1968 when they looked back at the, the world and said, you know, could we set ourselves a challenge to damage half the, uh, half the ocean? And yet that's what we've been doing. And yet it's so important when we actually look at the ocean, 93% of the heat has been absorbed into the ocean. It's been our friend. It's shielded us from uh, more extreme climate change we would otherwise had. It's shielded us by absorbing a quarter, just over a quarter of the carbon dioxide, but the price we pay, as we know now, is ocean acidification. And it's the place where all the water is, in effect. So as you thermally expand it, you get sea level rise. And we know the temperature trends on land have been going up, but when you factor the ocean in to the debate, and we have the climate doubters who said there's, there's a pausing of the temperature on land, is it real? Let me show you the warming in the ocean. The bottom bit here, the khaki line, is the debate about warming on land. I've expanded the bit, which is the slight turndown that the climate skeptics would look at, but look at the heat going into the ocean. So we are actually locking in things which are going to be difficult to reverse that will affect all of us, whether it's for aquaculture, whether it's for fisheries, whether it's for any other use of the ocean that depends on natural resources. It's all on the move. So we have a choice here. We can continue as we're doing, we can deplete, we can sustain, or we can try and restore. We can try and recover ecosystem resilience. The challenge we've now got, because we didn't start doing that enough earlier on, is these multiple stresses. So this is the warming of the ocean, the ocean acidification. And as water warms, it contains less oxygen. So we see oxygen sags, not just dead zones on the seabed, sags of oxygen in the mid-water layers now. So we're going to have to tackle that, and that means we're going to need even more ambition. So if it's difficult enough to get governments to act, the circumstance we're in means we've actually got to have more ambition to do more to counter the challenges that we see. I won't spend too much time on this. We talked about this yesterday. Governments have agreed to protect the ocean. This is a, an agreement that is over two decades in the making. This is before ocean acidification was even a search term on Google. And it wasn't a search term in even half that time. And so when we meet as IUCN, the specialists and the scientists are saying, it's at least 30% we ought to strictly protect now. And that shift is because of the gross changes we're making to the ocean. It's no longer fisheries or pollution. It's the fact you need more space for the ocean to be resilient to help us ride out the silent storm that is coming from these big changes we now see happening. And that's the definition. Um, we talked about that yesterday. I won't say too much more on it. But what I did is slip this slide in. This is the um, uh, Malcolm Burroughs work, which I referred to yesterday. Take a careful look at this. I'll leave this as a, in the PDF. These are the marine climate trajectories. So this is the speed and direction in which climate is going to drive things in the ocean. And if you look at the velocity of kilometers per decade, it's fairly frightening the pressure we're putting on resources to, and the, the species will move to try and keep pace with their niches. And so this is part of the silent storm that is coming to affect us. So what are we doing about it? Well, at IUCN, with uh, partners, we formed something called the International Marine Protected Area Congresses. So the first one was held in, uh, so the last one was held in France in 2013. The next one is in Chile. And this is an opportunity to try and bring the, the marine protected area science community get together with users, with politicians, give them a forum, try and get more cohesion, more speed, more rapidity, around decisions and action and sharing of resources and information. Part of this is a determined effort from us in IUCN to help the community publish more and publish things much more quickly. So we now have done a deal with Wiley and Aquatic Conservation. So we have these big global meetings, more or less one a year. And what would happen is everyone would come to the meeting, they'd present their wonderful ideas and they'd go back to the office and do what they were doing before. What we're trying to do now is capture those advances, get them into out of grey literature, into peer-reviewed information to make it available to the international community and do that within a year. 
and we're more or less doing that now. So on the, the, if you want to know some of the major discoveries from the World Parks Congress in Sydney, it will be published into the World Conservation Congress this year in Hawaii. We'll do one from Hawaii, which will be published in. So we're trying to actually pass that torch forward and get information out there much more quickly. It's no good having experts if they're not publishing. So we, need, we know we need to help that logjam of the challenge of getting stuff into publication. We're also working very hard on the paper park issue. So I've heard it yesterday. What good is it creating these places if they're not properly managed? And so this is the whole issue about developing something called the green list. So these are places where management is going well. And this is also a process countries can join so that it's not so much the end point, but the journey and helping them understand how to manage places effectively, which becomes important. And a lot of this is about trying to actually understand resilience. It's about biodiversity, but it's also about trying to make uh, area-based mechanisms give us the best chance at, at riding out some of the big changes which will happen. And we know from coral reefs where we have places that are fairly remote, that haven't been so impacted, where we haven't had to control the stresses and had those challenges, they get knocked back by big events, but they recover much more quickly. So resilience is real, and we need to think of how to, how to engender this much more in our activities. We also need to not forget that we tend to take a westernized view of protecting the environment, and yet that's not the bulk of the world. The bulk of the world is about communities coming together and community leadership and, uh, and establishing rules through non-legal means, traditional means, that are probably more effective than some of the stuff we try and do in our parts of the world. And so we need to embrace that far more. And you'll see a, a massive shift from IUCN on recognizing this coming up within the next probably six, uh, six to 12 months. We also need to remove the excuses. So I showed yesterday a map with very large marine protected areas and the excuse is they're too remote, they're too large, they're too difficult to manage. The reality is we have technology and we can use that technology and that technology is becoming much cheaper. There are several systems being developed. This is one from Pew. Google also has another one with partners called Eyes on the Sea. And this uses the capabilities of satellite technology. Remember, probably in 14 months time, uh, Google built, bought something called Skybox. It's one of the constellation systems of cuboid satellites. This will be able to give us, when they have them all up, meter resolution coverage of the whole of the planet three times a day. So the idea that we can't see where things are, and also with Pew's system, they've successfully followed fishing boats and prosecuted. They've successfully followed fishing boats and uh, prosecuted um, uh, without actually needing to use enforcement vessels. The track was good enough for uh, the courts. This is uh, actually how they do it. It's actually a catapult center. The UK has invested considerable money in genome technology, in uh, satellites and other... Could someone tell them to keep quiet out the back? Um, the UK has invested in uh, these centers that uh, enables you to access the technology. We have one on satellites, so you, it's a window into the satellite world and this means you can use that capability, the full capability of countries, to track vessels. Here's a vessel fishing. It's actually doing nothing wrong, uh, but it shows you can actually show and put together features of the seabed with fishing vessels live. So there's these types of technologies, and there's new technologies coming along. President Obama announced at the, our ocean conference in Chile just last year some new developments, something called Sea Scout, and, so, and something using visible infrared imaging radio, radio, radiometry. So it's not just about the traditional satellites, it's about the fact you can see vessels as well. So they can switch off their transponders, but you can still see them. This is an image, quite a beautiful image, actually taken from the space station by one of the astronauts of fishing boat lights at night. So the reality is there's a variety of layers you can bring together that give you a better chance of being able to manage these places and not have to invest in new brigades and fleets of patrol vessels. It's about bringing things together much more. 
We've also brought together key personalities to help us lead the charge, people that prime ministers respond to. Sylvia Earle in the middle behind Richard Branson uh, to his, which direction we're looking at, to the left, Queen Noor, for example, Ted Turner, um, a whole range of people, and we actually use them. So when we want to get some progress, um, I have an issue in the UK over something, uh, we can talk to Ocean Elders, and Richard Branson will write to Cameron. He'll get a reply back within three or four days and probably a telephone call. So we can find routes to, to cut through the bypass to talk directly to the politicians. The result of that one was actually half of Ascension Island in the Atlantic being made a marine reserve uh, about the size of the UK. So we can get real action by using these different routes. So a lot of this is what I would call to, to, I think, uh, Jerry, we were talking about yesterday about outside the box stuff. This is some of our outside the box stuff to make things happen. We've also been looking at ways of bringing the ocean alive to a lot more people. So we've worked very hard over the last seven, eight years with Google uh, to put the ocean in everyone's hand. So this was the notion. This is when I became vice chair and I met with Sylvia Earle and we schemed over the fact that we should take the real world put it into the virtual world, and we effectively talked to Google and had Google completely rebuild Google Earth with the best three-dimensional, at-scale ocean representation there is. This is no longer on Google Earth when you do a search on Google Maps. We got to over a billion people on Google Earth with the downloads alone about three years ago, so about a sixth of the planet. Um, now when you do a search on Google Maps, you'll see a 3D representation of the ocean. So it's not going to solve the world, but it's going to show people it's not a flat blue bit of planet. It's actually got things in it. And so it's part of the, the information technology battle we have to get people better informed. That, by doing that, we then provided new platforms to create new technologies to bring the ocean even more alive. So we have a partnership with something called XL Catlin Sea View. So Street View. On Google, you go and look for your car in your driveway and see what's in your neighbor's garden and things like that. Um, you can now do Street View underwater, and it uses this, uh, they're about a quarter of a million dollars each, these cameras, and uh, you can actually go and do Street View underwater. So this brings the, the ocean alive to, to a lot more people. We've been doing it for a few years. So what I'll do now is show you about one and a half minute clip that we had Google put together with Catlin to show you this technology, and hopefully this technology will work. So if you're not a diver, you can go diving in 19 countries now and go and show your children what it looks like. Um, so it's a way in which we're breaking, using technology to break down barriers. Um, those of you who've got kids, they spend most of their lives on these things. So let's put oceans on these things. That's what we're doing. So we're also working on the high seas. So I explained the challenge of the high seas, not having a conservation framework. Well, it might have a conservation framework. To do this, we've had to get, uh, I think it's 32 major NGOs all working together 
all saying the same thing. And they said it wasn't possible. It is possible. It's called the High Seas Alliance. And because we've got that number of NGOs working together, they've been able to, to persuade the United Nations that they need to amend what's called the law of the sea, which is effectively the rule of the waves. And they're now looking at an implementing agreement. And this was agreed in January last year in the middle of a blizzard, another blizzard in New York, uh, where they stayed up all night. And they now have a process running this year and next year in something called PrepCon meetings. It's in March, the first one, um, two months time, uh, to actually negotiate what the terms of that might look like. So is, there is hope for the high seas. You know, even things like the UN are not too big that we can't try and do something, but we have to adapt and reorganize ourselves in ways that we can make an impact uh, at that scale. And finally, it's about inspiring more people to act. So I talked about Sylvia earlier, uh, and Sylvia won something called the TED Award. It's uh, very American. It's uh, technology, entertainment, and design. And it's where they bring together those communities to recognize one to three people a year. There's a money prize, but also there's a prize which is a wish to change the world. And so after a lot of discussion with Sylvia behind the scenes, she didn't need much encouraging, um, her wish was about igniting public support to get people to care about the ocean much more. Part of this is the, the, the brilliant idea of hope spots. So a lot of the places you see in the ocean are where scientists or governments have said we ought to protect. Well, why not give the public the opportunity to say where they think ought to be protected? Generally, they don't put forward stupid places. They put forward places which are really quite good. So this is the idea that Sylvia has for Hope Spots. We have had hundreds of groups around the world wanting to do something for their ocean. So perhaps this is another way where we rather than take it to the public and ask the public, do you, like, do you think the science, scientists' report is good? Why not have the public come and then work with the scientists and the politicians to try and do something? And apart from anything else, this has been the only route. You'll notice there are dots in the high seas here. This has been the only route we've been able to use to put names and a, an entire, an entire vocabulary around the high seas, places like the White Shark Cafe, people who have never heard of about otherwise because they were locked into that UN process. We've unlocked it and we've taken it to the public. How many public? The outreach around Sylvia each month is around 28 million. So one individual potentially could help change the world. Part of this was also about bringing together a unique set of people. If you took 100 people, some of the best scientists, some of the best celebrities, some of the richest people in the world, put them on a ship, showed them the ocean, you might do something really special, which is what we also did. So we took Sylvia, uh, we started filming there. Um, that's Leonardo DiCaprio with a uh, giant tortoise, uh, Glenn Close, Ed Norton. Um, and we took them and they have their networks and one of the people on the ship said, do you want a feature film? I'll give you, a, I'll pay for it, I'll give you a feature film. So this is Mission Blue, this is Netflix first and only um, ocean documentary. Uh, Netflix now is present in 60 or 70 country, at, I don't know what scale now, it's tens, hundreds of millions of people. Um, so we created this film, it's gone down rather well. The only ocean documentary that Netflix has is the only thing they won an Emmy for out of all the stuff they show. So it's now an award-winning film. That was last autumn. What I'll do to end, um, and we're not filming this bit, I hope. We can't film the next bit because of copyright, is I'll show you uh, one of the key moments from the film of what ocean recovery looks like. This is, I think, a truly inspirational bit about local communities working together. This is not me. It's what a community did to recover the ocean and recover the value. And hopefully, this will play. Thanks so much indeed. Thank you.
stunned silence. A fantastic contribution to the conference, and I suppose uh, one of the things I found quite striking in the uh, Mission Blue documentary is it, it reaches out to an audience uh, which normally the oceans community can't get at. So yeah. I highly recommend this, and uh, it was great to see it featuring in your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dan. Thanks for a really nice presentation. I I now realize the the, the fact why there is just a 3.5 percent of sea protect is the fact that those decisions are hard to take in high seas, no? Which is actually the way to to be able to to make a, or to delimit a marine protect area within high seas. There should be a, a UN a agreement with all the state members. Yeah, and this is not easy to achieve, I guess, no? And well, it, there should be, and the problem is that um, I think I mentioned yesterday the deep sea mining example is a good example. Um, they're able to make fairly rapid decisions on deep sea mining. As I say, one of the places is 88, the exploration area is 80% of the size of the contiguous United States. So they can take decisions at scale. When you come to marine protected areas, we go through this convoluted process, which I guess we have to do, my fear is that they will stretch that out for another 10 years um, while they debate the, the PrepCon meetings are about making the ideas of what the agreement should be. It's not the agreement, it's the discussion of the ideas about the agreement and then they've got to go through the agreement bit. So, you know, one of the, so we have a real problem that we have a discontinuity anyway between protected areas out to 200 miles and on land, what's happening in the ocean, what other sectors are able to do. And I think, you know, you should be taking, just as we would take, an integrated view of areas. You should have the mechanisms to be able to do those integrated views. One of the things we're, we're actually doing, and it will go to the World Heritage Committee um, in July next year, is actually alongside that which will trundle on, is trying to get other bits of the system to recognize the high seas. So uh, World Heritage sites are established on something called Outstanding Universal Value. Well, outstanding universal value doesn't stop at 200 miles. It goes out into the open ocean. We've already recognized places like the Titanic through that. So we're trying that route as well to put more pressure on the system. But if you can also recognize quality through global conventions, you can try and squeeze the politicians in the UN to get on with it, basically. They're in the right direction, and congratulations to them, but we, we need to move, and we need to be able to have those mechanisms. So, I, I think we should all thank Dan for his uh, wonderful presentation. Yes, I'm out of here in 45 minutes. <laughs>
to look at the interactions of global change with regional and local scale impacts. And that's probably one of the underlying themes of this talk. I'm also going to make a, a very strong case for long-term observations, because you can't understand climate change without long-term observations. Um, you also need a paleo approach as well. Um, but uh, I'm going to talk mainly about long-term observations, a little bit of modeling, and I'm not going to talk much about experiments, but in some of our other work, we've used experiments to actually look at processes. So the last 10 to 15 years has been full of headlines in magazines like Science and Nature about the state of the marine ecosystems. Um, Jeremy Jackson, who was in being photographed with Sylvia Earle in uh, Dan LaFolle's video, has been author of many of these different papers. So you could, you could have a very pessimistic attitude about the oceans, but I'm a, I'm a glass half full rather than a half empty person. And I still think by being sensible, by monitoring and by adaptive management, we can manage the oceans in a rapidly changing world. And I suppose that's the theme of my talk. But at the end of the day, we've switched, this is in the UK, be the same in the Canaries, from small scale artisanal fishing. These are people catching pilchards, also called sardines, um, from small sailing boats, very short supply chain, that's the fishing fleet, that's the market on the beach, very short supply chains, generally local markets, though a lot of the sardines would have gone to the Mediterranean in, 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 a, in a pickled form, but generally very short supply chains. And if it was dark enough, you could see that this guy here has actually got a load of seaweed on a donkey. And basically, fertilization was organic in those days. No, no industrial nitrogen from the atmosphere, no rock phosphate being mined and taken halfway around the world. So we've gone from local and artisanal use of the oceans to a sort of a global and industrial use of the oceans. And that's really the pressures that we're dealing with, coupled with increasing population, which is driving anthropogenic climate change and changes to the biogeochemical cycles, such as ocean acidification. So what I'm going to do in my talk is I'm going to do a very brief tour of various impacts in the ocean. I'm not going to consider ocean acidification because I don't have time. Um, and then I'm going to focus on work that was done primarily during my time at the Marine Biological Association in Plymouth when I was director between 1999 and uh, 2007 and subsequently. Much of this work was funded by the Marklin project. Um, and I'm also going to, when I talk about this work, I'm going to talk about long-term observations. I'm going to talk about separation of fishing effects from climate. And they're going to talk about rocky shore species as cheap indicators of climate change. And they're going to finish with some messages, messages about adapting to climate change. And I suppose it's always good to get your message in at the beginning and hopefully I'll remember to do it at the end. The only way that we can manage uh, climate change going forward is actually managing the interactions of climate change with the regional and local scale impacts that we can do something about. We can't do much about climate change for the next 50 years until mitigation uh, kicks in or new technologies kick in. But what we can do is we can manage the interactions of climate change with regional and local scale impacts, all of which we've got much more control over. And um, this work was funded by multiple UK and Irish agencies, um, some of whom no longer exist um, due to government cuts and reorganization. Um, and also Dan LaFolle, who was here previously, was a strong champion and advocate of this work with John Baxter. And they helped get the funding to do much of the long-term work that I'm going to be talking about. But Dan's gone, so there was no point giving him a big thank you, was there, really? <laughs> OK, so global environmental change. Climate change is not just about temperature, it's about storms, precipitation, frequency extreme events, possible shifts in weather systems like the North Atlantic Oscillation or the ENSO in the um, Southern Ocean Oscillation, and also sea level rise. And ocean, changes in ocean pH is strictly not climate change. This is a biogeochemical side effect of too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
And these shifts are going to influence biodiversity and ecosystems in various ways. There's going to be shifts in environmental gradients on the seashore desiccation wave action in the plankton stratification. And there'll be effects of salinity in estuaries and lagoons. There's also going to be a change in the frequency of disturbance events. 100-year storms are going to become 10-year storms. 10-year storms are going to become annual events. So there's going to, we're going to be in a much more extreme and more disturbed world. We're already seeing poleward migration of species. I'm going to give you some examples of that. There's going to be changes in assemblage composition and the interactions in assemblages. And a lot of that in marine systems is going to be driven by recruitment regimes, by the uh, input of larvae and propagules into the system. And also, in a warming, more extreme world, opportunist species do well. And there's a greater likelihood of invasion by non-native species. So Jeremy Jackson, the long-haired bloke with Sylvia Earl, also talked about global fishing down of the, of the food chain. We're losing the top levels and we're getting down to the smaller levels. This is extremely difficult to reverse because these are very, very long-lived and often low fecundity species that get fished out. This is something that really interests me. There's a sort of like a global homogenization of faunas. This is a harbour wall in New Zealand. It's got barnacles and mussels, Ostromineus and Mytilus. This is a harbour wall in Liverpool. It's got Ostromineus and Mytilus. Mytilus is a northern hemisphere uh, species, so it's an invasive in New Zealand. Ostromineus, Elminius in old money, is an Australian barnacle that got into the UK and Europe during the last war where there are lots of convoys and things. So we've got this sort of global homogenization. I tend to think of Mytilus as being a bit like the Big Mac of the muscle world. It's, it's everywhere. And Alminius is a bit like Kentucky Fried Chicken. Now we've got this sort of globalization of, um, of species. We might only have two or three brands left at some stage, which is just everywhere. And I think this is a real global threat with local consequences. And of course, plastic litter. My One of my colleagues, uh, Richard Thompson's done a lot of work of this in Plymouth on plastic litter, which is a, a ubiquitous problem. And of course, you get stochastic local impacts. Um, this is one where um, I think alcohol was probably involved. Um, and uh, this is a disturbance event, and this car ended up on the seashore in North Wales. So there's all sorts of impacts at all sorts of scales with all sorts of different causality. So we live in a rapidly changing world. There's notable change at global and regional scales, but there are, there are local implications of these changes. And the second take home message is detecting change is very, very difficult unless you've got long-term and broad scale data. Because without that, you can't really get a handle of climate. And the other problem is you've got to distinguish between weather and climate. Climate operates over degrees of latitude and over decades. Weather is what happened last year. And dealing with the public and with politicians, if you get one cold winter, global warming doesn't exist. Um, you've got to take a long-term view. And the final take-home message is long-term and broad-scale data are, invalu are invaluable, but they're highly vulnerable. And they're particularly vulnerable to uncertainty in funding, particularly at times of uh, global financial uh, austerity. So austerity and monitoring don't go together. So I'm getting rid of the University of Southampton's corporate colours now and going back to where a lot of this work was done, which was done at the Marine Biological Association of the UK, England's oldest marine lab, um, built in 1884, between 1884 and 1888, opened in 1888. And this is work by a host of people, but particularly a partner, Alan Southwood, who passed away a few years ago, Mike Burroughs, Nova Mishkushka, Martin Jenner, David Sims. So, but lots of other people have been involved in, in this work in a variety of ways. And also past generations of MBA staff. So I'm going to talk about restart of offshore time series, separation of climate from fishing, rocky shore indicators, give some examples of modelling, and then talk about um, climate change adaptation. So fisheries investigations started in 1887 in Plymouth, ahead of the lab. And at that stage, fishing was a craft, um, very much in tune with the ecosystem, low technology. 
though um, these guys here we think are part of the MBA staff um, classic public sector over manning and they're having far more fun than the guys that are doing fishing for a, for a living there we think that's an early MBA fishing um, research vessel so over the years oceanographic research hasn't changed very much you stick things over the side including expensive rosette samplers and sometimes you get them back sometimes you don't we lost that one on the Edison I was rather cross um, so a lot of the MBA time series started uh, as part of the beginning of the ICES program in, in, the, in, the, in the early 1900s, 1902, 1903. And this was in response to overfishing in the North Sea that was evident by the 1890s. And these are part of the international um, investigations and various parameters were measured over the time and you can see that many of them stopped in the 1980s that was the last time that the UK had a major financial crisis so um, the ultimate cause of the demise of those time series is probably Mrs Thatcher and as director I managed to get a load of soft money to restart a lot of these time series from various government agencies so there were a few we were able to restart we weren't able to do the the phytoplankton prime production measurements because the techniques they'd used in the 1960s were so dangerous that you couldn't do them anymore. Uh, health and safety standards had uh, moved on a little bit. And this graph shows temperature off Plymouth from 1870 to 2014. And this is a really important, this is sea surface temperature in the square off Plymouth from all sources off the um, Hadley Centre website. And when the lab was founded, it was a warm period. It was then very cold, either side of the First World War. But then was a period of warming up to 1959. 62, 63 was a very cold winter. That was the first time I saw snow as a six-year-old in, in, in Devon. Um, and then during the 60s and 70s and 80s, it was quite a cold period. And when I started working on climate fluctuations and marine life then, I was actually interested in it getting colder compared to the warm 1950s. And then about 1987, it started getting warmer and we had, a, we had some recent rapid warming. We had a very cold winter in 2010, got colder again. And, uh, but even so, even with a couple of colder years, we're still in a much, much warmer period than any previous warm, warm areas. And you've got to be aware that climate isn't a nice straight line. And I get very cross when people talk about so many degrees per decade. You've got to really get some idea about what the baseline was. And the British Isles and Ireland are particularly susceptible to climate change because they straddle a biogeographic boundary. You get cold water species to the north and warm water species to the south. Um, many of the cold water species actually invaded the North Atlantic over the North Pacific the last time there was no ice in the Arctic over the summer, about three, three to four million years ago. And these are basically Atlantic species coming up from the south. So there's a collision of marine clades straddling the British Isles. And to give you an example, herring, a cold water species, pilchards, also called sardines, are a warm water species. And in the English Channel, they, they overlap. And in the 1930s, the herring fishery collapsed. These days we blame the common fisheries policy, probably the Spanish, probably lots of people. But at the time in the 1930s, this collapse in the herring fishery was clearly due to changes in the oceanography of Plymouth and was spotted as such. Um, sometime later, herring didn't come back, but actually in the 1970s and 80s, there were no herring to come back because all the, all the populations were overfished in Northern Europe. If we look at sardines, a warm water species, in recent years, they've been doing rather well. These are, fish, these, are, these are catch statistics. This was a huge fishing industry. These are all the herring boats, and this collapsed over four or five years during this period of, of, of warming up to before the Second World War. But you've got to be careful with fishery statistics. If you look at the plankton, there was actually lots and lots of, um, of sardines, pilchards, in the water as evidenced by their eggs. They weren't 
in the catches because there was no market for sardines in the UK. People didn't like eating them. So um, there was a lot, of, a lot of sardines around. And these are cold water species, these are sardines, these are larvae of cold water species. Then in recent years, um, the, the warm water species are coming back again. The sardines are coming back again big time. So be cautious with fishery statistics because it's not just what's there, it's what the demand is. Um, so that's climate. And when they should have come back again, the, there were so few herring around the British coast, there was probably no seed populations to recover. And if we look at the bottom fisheries of Plymouth, we've got data from 1909, 1910. We've got some data from the 50s. We've got some data from the 70s and 80s. And we resumed fishing in, uh, in 2000. And you can see climate drivers. So with sparrows, um, they weren't around when it was cold. They were around in the warm 50s. They weren't around very much in the cold 60s and 70s and 80s. And then when we resumed fishing, we were catching more sparrows. I actually catch Sparrosoratus outside my back door in Plymouth these days when I'm fishing, a Mediterranean species. It's there. If we look at this trace of skates and rays, this is a fishing trace. You can see they were in trouble before the First World War. Four years of U-boats were very good for skate and the skate populations recovered after the First World War, but since then there's been decline. So in this data set, we've got a climate signal and we've got a fishing signal. The overall assemblage, though, does respond to fishing, um, uh, does respond to climate. So this is analyzing the whole assemblage, and there was quite a, quite a strong climate signal. We've got a few extra years data, and we we're able then to get a better handle of the effect of fishing versus climate. But this is good evidence. This is the boat in 1963. Look at the size of the fish. This is the boat, same, same net, fishing on the same ground as this is in 2001. Look at the size of the fish. Completely restructuring of, 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 the, uh, of the food web. So with a couple of extra years data in the 2000s, we were able to get some handle of sea surface temperature. This is fishing pressure in the whole of the English Channel. And the smaller species actually track climate change quite well. This is a total catch with a covered cod end. But the large species don't track climate change. And that's because the climate signal is being completely overridden by fishing pressure. And my colleague Martin, we published in Global Change Biology, looked at the slopes of size of fish over the 100 year period and showed that there was no change in sizes uh, for the smaller non commercial fish. But once fish get to about that size, then there was a very, very sharp, as maximum body size, there was a very, max, there was a very sharp decline because they were getting completely truncated by by fishing pressure for some of the bigger things. So the skates and rays, um, monkfish um, were being affected. Some of the smaller fish were not being affected by overfishing. So huge changes in fish, interaction of climate and fishing driving the bottom fish. Um, good evidence of advanced of southern species, but the northern species were persistent, which is interesting. And of course, with the herring and pilchard, we know that these fluctuations go back to the 13th century because there's good records in the customs books. And we know that you get herring during cold periods and sardines during warm periods. And you can historically tra trace this back, back to the medieval warm period. So now on to rocky shore monitoring. Um, there's a huge legacy of this in Europe, in France, Spain, and Portugal by Fisher Piet, in the UK by Crispin Southwood, work of Jack Lewis and team. And I've been going out on the beach since 1980, so I've, I've contributed to some of these time series. And rocky shore surveys are cheap in the British, um, but if you're trying to sell it to funders, you say cost effective. Um, you don't need boats, you don't need stuff, but certainly in the UK, it could get a little wet and chilly on occasions. Okay. So we had a huge baseline. We were able to, um, all these sites around Britain and Ireland, we were able to, um, and this is using quick and dirty, semi-quantitative abundance scales. We were able to do that. 
we showed some range extensions. This is Gibbler and Villicalis, which goes from Senegal to Scotland. We found range extensions at its northern limit and breeding populations at its northern limit. And we found several species which were winners, southern species doing well. And interestingly, only a few losers, only a few losers. Um, northern species not doing so well, though this species has disappeared from Spain now. It used to be very common in the Galician Rias, and another colleague, David Weathy, has shown that it's disappeared from northern Spain. The best quantitative data we've got are for intertidal barnacles. Um, this is a northern species. These other two are southern species, Cephalamus montagui, Cephalamus stellatus. And Alan Southwood had been counting these since the 1950s. The 50s were warm, lots of cephalamids. The 60s and 70s were cold, lots of semibalanus. And then um, in recent years, I resumed the counts and we were getting m many more cephalamus than even the warmest period of the 1950s. But interestingly, the cold species were still persisting. And this is one site that we managed to keep going throughout this period, warm, cold, warm, and here's an Australian invasive coming in, in into the assemblage. This is data from 1950 to date, and this is a recent update to 2009. And you can see in recent years, the warm water species are really, really going mad and taking over. And we've seen rain shifts in the English Channel. This is where Southampton is. Everything used to stop on the Isle of Wight. And in recent years, several species have shown range extensions further east into the colder waters of the Eastern English Channel. So this is a polewood extension um, into colder waters up the English Channel. But it varies with different species. Why they're doing this, they're reproducing better, but also in response to stormier seas, we've defended a lot of the coast. And these are very helpful stepping stones for species um, in terms of enabling range extensions. So we've seen quite a few range extensions there. Now, if you've got good data, you can, you can do correlations. But we also wanted to do some predictions. And we use barnacles because we know a lot about them. And from experimental data, we know about the interactions between these species. So when it's northern, this species wins. When it's southern, cephalamids win. And in the British Isles, there's an overlap zone where this species outcompetes this species. We know this from experimental work. We know that the northern species is more competitive. And this is the data. There's a positive, relation, a positive relationship for the warm water species and a negative relationship for the, for the um, cold water species. But if you do some fancy analysis, it shows that whilst there's a very strong negative relationship for semi the the relationship um, the relationship for cathalamids is not significant. The cathalamids are actually correlated with the semi -balanus. So what's happening is in warm years, the warm water species are being released from competition with the more competitive northern species, which dies. So it's an indirect effect of climate change rather than a direct effect. So we were able to model this. We did a model with physics, and we did a model with, um, with biology in it, with competition. And the one with competition is much more plausible. We then use that with different emission scenarios. And I suppose the take home message here is that um, the species, which was the dominant barnacle in the UK in the 1930s, even under low emission scenarios, is going to go extinct at some stage in the future. And the southern cathalamid species are going to take over. So the rocky shores of Devon are going to look like the rocky shores of Spain in about 20 or 30 years' time. So coming to here, what about islands and enclosed seas? So there's, there's various glacial relics in the Adriatic. They're going to be very, very vulnerable because they've got nowhere to go, like Fucus phosoides. Um, in Macronesia, Fucus spiralis, Fucus garii, is probably at its southern range edge and is probably at risk. And there may be others. Maybe yesterday's talk about Sister Sira as an example. But I think in much of Macronesia, particularly the Azores, in the intertidal, I think overcollecting of major grazers like limpets is probably going to be more important than, than climate change, but the two are likely to interact. 
But climate change is not just temperature, it's extreme wave events. And in response to this, we're hardening the coast and we're turning soft shores into hard shores. Uh, this is sea defense. This is in Italy on the Adriatic. And these, these sea defenses there are actually um, and not against flooding, they're to maintain beaches so you can get lots of semi-naked German tourists there in the summer. It's uh, very much a um, recreationally based thing. And I'm sure that there are lots of sea defences in the Canaries which are built to maintain uh, recreational beaches. Now, engineers like smooth surfaces, but nature likes it rough. And it, mussels, Barnacles, limpets, all like pits and pools and, 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 and rock pools. And one of the big things with engineers is to try to persuade them not to do nice smooth lines. So we've been working a lot with engineers in recent years to try to get them to put some rock pools or, make, or use rock, rough surfaces to give nature a chance. It's not great if you have to build a sea defence, but if you must, at least make it eco-friendly. And... Um, this is an example of a, of a block which we persuaded a council in Wales to put in a new sea defence. It's got rock pools, it's groovy, there's lots of heterogeneity from marine life to live there. It took a long time persuading the council to do this. Um, we got a mould, we cast this block, and unfortunately the mould broke after the first block was, was, was deployed. So we had no replicates. But mind you, we published an engineering journal. You don't need replicates in engineering journals. Uh, so we got away with it. So, concluding remarks. Lots of changes occurring. Plankton, fish, European rocky shores. Intertidal species are very cost-effective for monitoring. These changes are going to have major consequences for structure and functioning of coastal ecosystems. Um, shores in the UK are going to get more dominated by barnacles, less seaweeds, less productive. Species on islands and enclosed seas are particularly vulnerable. They've got nowhere to go, particularly those big sea gaps. And in order to understand this, we need long-term observations. We need experiment to understand processes. And we need modeling based on experiment to actually um, get beyond just forecast and get somewhere towards prediction. And if we want to adapt to climate change, first of all, we need to be able to separate out this sort of long wavelength, low amplitude oscillations that, wave, that climate creates from the kind of noise you get in most ecosystems. But also you get natural noise, but you also get problems with local and regional scale impacts. And, you know, I, I hope we do mitigate. I hope we stop putting greenhouse gases into the environment. But the inertia of the system is such we can't do much about it for the next 50 to 100 years. So we've got to manage interactions of climate change with those things we can control on a global scale, non-native species. And this is a good example. The Pacific oyster was introduced to the UK by the government in the 1970s and 60s on the grounds it was too cold for it to naturally breed. Of course, it was cold in the 60s and 70s, it's now warm. This species is going absolutely crazy in northern Europe, forming big reefs in the, in the Netherlands and the UK, and displacing mussel fisheries. So you've got to be very, very careful when it comes to introducing species for, for aquaculture. So you can do something about that. We heard about ballast water control. We can do lots of things to help control non-native species. We can do a lot about managing fishing. We can do a lot about eutrophication. So in order to adapt to a rapidly changing world, we've got to manage these interactions of climate change with the things that we can manage. Because basically, climate change tends to make things worse. There's very, very few examples of climate change making a, an interaction with, a, with an impact better. So that's my message. Manage the things that we can do, and if we do that, we give resilience to ecosystems because an overfished population will be less resilient to climate change. A population of fish stressed by climate change will be less resilient to overfishing. We have to manage those interactions. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Steve. Perfect in time. We have time for a couple of questions. Ah, okay. 
uh, thanks for this presentation. Uh, I would like to ask two things. First is uh, when you talk about uh, the monitoring program, which you showed in the beginning and which was started in the 20s, and then it was stopped in the 80s, and you said that when you've been director, you restarted the game. For me, this is uh, quite interesting. Why this stop? Why this gap of the monitoring program? How this happened? Money was short, but was it's short. it's so and many. And people say, "Oh, you just measuring noise. You know, you just measuring noise. What's your hypothesis?" And um, I think it was very. I think it was very unfortunate with with the timing. The the champion of that work was made to take early retirement, and there was not a champion. Time series need hypotheses and they need champions. And that's why I use the word sustained observing. It's not monitoring. Monitoring is about regulation. Sustained observing is about understanding. And it's very, very difficult. All those data sets are at risk. My intertidal work, I fund myself. Every time I get any consultancy money, I put it in an account, and I use my own money, which could go into my bank account, to keep it going. But I can afford to do that. I'm a dean. I get paid a load of money. Um, but that's that, that's how desperate that's how desperate it is in keeping these things going. And um, I'm hoping to hand over. You know, my knees are getting a bit bad now. I was 62 weeks ago. I'm hoping to hand this over to another generation of people. And it's very very difficult. It, it, the continuous plankton recorder was closed in the 18, in, in 1980s, and it was rescued as a private foundation. They published some fantastic papers on global change. That nearly died, and it was rescued. So it's, um, it's about informing people. It's about getting high-grade high publications out. But it's also about getting the work into the policy environment and persuading people that it does matter. Because if you understand the system, you can take a more precautionary approach to, to management of marine systems. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not working on that, but Dan Smale, who I know quite well is, and um, Laminaire Ocaluca is beginning to replace um, Laminaria Digitata uh, and Hyperborea in the shallow zone, and also Saccharisa polycides, which is the only kelp that gets down as far as Portugal and Morocco, is, be is becoming a bit more common. But I think it's a combination of temperature and disturbance. I think we've had some strong winters, and um, Saccharise is an opportunist species, and it comes in when there's disruption. So we're doing some, exp I've got a student with Dan, and we're doing some experiments um, looking at uh, interactions between uh, Hyperborea and Digitata and other species. So it is happening. Um, but generally, the northern species outcompete the southern species. And it's when they're released from competition that the southern species come in. And that's the paradox why the northern species persist, but they only need to recruit once in five or 10 years and the populations will come in and they tend to have big recruitment events linked to the spring phytoplankton bloom. Okay, Bruno, your last one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm very worried about the idea of there's some good environmental status with a reference state and a baseline. The data that I've shown shows that you've got a wobbling baseline and you've actually got probably a multi-dimensional envelope, which is what natural conditions are and things are pinging around within, within that. So, you know, there's lots of fine words 
in the Marine Strategy Framework Directive about good environmental status and uh, reference conditions, but you've got to you've got to take a much more probabilistic approach, and you've also got to take a much more extensive approach because species will shift with time, and uh, you might have you might put some protection in for a particular thing, and it might disappear, and it might be just due to global change. Um, so you've got to you've got to have a very flexible and adaptive management approach, and I think a more probabilistic approach. Okay, thank you so much again, Steve. Our next.